All right, welcome again. Um, this is Frederick Schleiermacher, uh, 1768 to 1834, his intellectual uh, context and biography. Um, all the page citations you'll see here come from this very, very good text, uh, anthology of writings with a, a good introduction and then into the various uh, texts, the selections that have been um, included here. Uh, Frederick Schleiermacher, Pioneer of Modern Theology, edited by Keith uh, Clements. Um, just so you have uh, some sense uh, of, of Schleiermacher, this is the Christian faith. It's a massive, as you can see, uh, volume. So it's, it's uh, this, of course, I'd recommend as well, but the Clements volume is great to have. Um, it's something that's accessible and um, uh, introduced to the various uh, selections uh, very nicely. I also uh, would highly recommend, um, and occasionally, just a couple of times reference, uh, Claude Welch's two-volume Protestant Thought in the 19th Century, um, and it's uh, Yale University Press 72 now. It's available through uh, Whitfinstock uh, Publishers, uh, and that is all, those are both also really great volumes uh, to add to your theological library. All right, for the Schleiermacher Theological Themes, uh, you'll see a video lecture, which also um, it will be separate from uh, this one. So uh, first with Schleiermacher, I want to set him in his conceptual uh, context. Um, so in order to play Schleiermacher in context, it is important to have some beginning familiarity with three influential currents of European thought uh, in the 18th century. Uh, pietism, rationalism, and empiricism. Um, and Romanticism. Um, I'm, 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 rationalism and Empiricism are kind of putting together. Um, uh, by the 18th century, the Empiricism is, is uh, trumping Rationalism as, as kind of the dominant uh, philosophy of the day. So, first, Pietism, uh, which we already have some familiarity, familiarity with, uh, with our study of Wesley. Uh, pietism names a movement of evangelical revival uh, that largely began with the ministry and writings of the German Lutheran Philip Jacob Spener, uh, who lived um, in the latter part of the uh, 17th century. Um, and it continued with the work of the Moravian, whom we've encountered already uh, in our uh, talk on Wesley, Nicholas Zenzendorf, uh, who lived, of course, in the 18th century, and um, was the one who uh, founded and maintained um, a major Hernhut uh, community. Um, the Great Awakening, uh, and largely inspired by Jonathan Edwards in America in the 1730s to 1740s forward, um, and the Wesleyan Revival in England beginning from the 1740s. All these are part of um, and, and kind of follow from uh, the pietism of, of Spener and our, our sort of revival, spiritual revival that happens um, in uh, uh, Protestant churches, uh, which have have become, um, in, in the view of these revivalists, uh, too much religions without spirituality. Uh, a common theme among the revivalists was an emphasis upon active faith, um, in contrast, emphasis upon articles of belief. Um, and in particular, there's a concern with regard to inner religious life, or in the case of Methodism, as we know, with works of mercy. Uh, Zinzendorf was a key founder of the Moravian Brotherhood, which is, of course, again, in part famous for its influence upon John Wesley. As the name Moravian Brotherhood suggests, there was not only an emphasis upon personal conviction of sin and personal assurance of salvation, but upon the formation of communities of like-minded persons of faith into voluntary associations that would enrich the life of the whole church, and indeed of the entire community. All right, uh, so that's pietism, kind of the pietistic background. Uh, second, uh, rationalism and empiricism. Uh, by the late 18th and early 19th century, especially among cultural elites in Europe, uh, the success of the scientific revolution, including stunning advances in astronomy, physics, and chemistry, had fully vindicated uh, modern rationality and science. Appeals to tradition, when even geniuses among the ancients had proven to be so wrong about the world, uh, appeals to tradition had been discredited. Even the supposed giants of the past, Plato and Aristotle and all the religious greats, 
literally had no clue about where they were in the cosmos. So reliance upon deductive reasoning and experimental evidence uh, were seen to be clearly superior to blind appeal to tradition and scriptures. In the medieval period, theology had, theology had been seen as the queen of the sciences. But in modernity, an opposition begins to be conceived between faith and reason, or between faith and knowledge, with faith located on the irrational, unjustified side of the equation. By Schleiermacher's day, this opposition was solidly established among intellectuals, and of course its influence continues to be very strong even into the 21st century. In this context, many Christians, including many major philosophers and sciences, scientists, beginning from the 17th century with Descartes, Locke, and even Newton, um, began to construct arguments for the existence of God. For example, the Englishman William Paley's famous book, Natural Theology, or Evidences of the Existence and Attributes of the Deity, um, that advanced the famous watchmaker argument for God, was published in 1802. So this is contemporary to Schleiermacher. This picture of the world as a giant mechanism, it is important to note, is accepted by many arguing for God's existence. Note that above all, Paley's God is the engineer of a great mechanism and, as with all arguments for the existence of God, the path to knowledge of God lies through human reasoning. Contrast this, for instance, with the spirituality um, of Wesley or Schleiermacher's theology and their visions of God. This modern attempt, these modern attempts to construct arguments for the existence of God continue in some quarters to this day. None have been deemed remotely successful. Let me note in passing that I specify these arguments are modern because arguments of this precise sort do not predate the modern period. I would argue that Anselm and Aquinas' so-called ontological and cosmological arguments only become arguments in the pertinent sense when they are revisioned from a modern perspective, uh, because in their native context they presupposed content-rich faith affirmations. Anselm's argument, for instance, takes place in the middle of a prayer. So that's the context of the argument, and it has to be read in that context. That would be seen as begging the question um, from a modern perspective. Similarly with Aquinas' uh, cosmological argument and its place in relationship to the rest of his uh, theology. Also notable was the recognition that the Bible itself was a historical document, one constrained by the languages and cultures of its composition. Before the Reformation, the authority and meaning of Scripture, was, at least for the Roman Catholic Church, um, and, and um, before the Schism of 1054 for the entire Church, the, from the time of, time of Nicaea, the First Council forward, the authority and meaning of Scripture was grounded in the authority of the Church. Uh, it's, the script, it's the Church which determines what Scripture and what the right interpretation of Scripture is. Um, the Reformation appeal to solo fide separates scripture from the authority and authoritative interpretation of the church. To be clear, I'm repeating myself here, this had already happened to some degree with the split between the Roman and Eastern Orthodox churches in 1054, but the Reformation amplified the issues to an unprecedented degree, especially in the West. By the 18th century, a profusion of Protestant denominations interpreted scripture to say a multitude of different things about baptism, Eucharist, faith and works, Jesus, and God. Moreover, for the first time in a millennium, that is, not since the patristic age, the question not of what the Bible said, but the question why believe the Bible to be true at all, was raised and demanded some reasonable answer. In other words, after the Reformation, everyone's appealing to Scripture, the Protestants are, but they have all so many different meanings, they have all these different denominations. So, so no one of their meanings can be seen as definitive. Uh, none of them have a basis that's, it's, it, that's clear and, and, and clear. It looks like a conflict of interpretations, um, which is ultimately uh, resolved by subjective preferences um, and just uh, tradition. <clears throat> 
Uh, so by the late teen, 18, uh, so, so, so that was the question that was raised, the, the tradition and appeals to scripture, uh, the, the Reformation, which resulted not only in a split between the Catholic and the Protestant churches, which had different canons, uh, let alone different interpretations, and then within the Protestant churches of all the different interpretations, this undercut uh, the appeal to, to scripture as a uh, um, uh, viable soul source. And of course that combined with the fact that whereas in the Renaissance we were looking back to the giants of the great uh, to get all this information to understand um, about the world, uh, with the Enlightenment we begin to discover where we are in the world and we realize that the ancient Greeks and those other um, giants who we looked back to didn't even know where they were uh, in the cosmos. So suddenly these uh, backward appeals uh, to scripture um, and to uh, philosophers of the past begin to look backward. Um, now, uh, that's when you get the arguments for the existence of God that I just referenced, like Paley's. But by the late 18th century, natural religion itself had come under attack. Um, miracles, far from being proof of the truth of Christianity, came themselves to be in need of proving, um, and certainly appeared to violate what we were learning from modern science. Uh, debates over the meaning of scripture, even with regard to central doctrines, was manifestly beyond any sure and uncontroversial resolution. Uh, the philosophers Hume, uh, though in works uh, only published posthumously in the early 19th century, and Kant uh, in the late uh, 18th century, this is just before Schleiermacher, um, decimated arguments uh, for the existence of God. Uh, for, furthermore, no compelling solution to the theodicy problem uh, was forthcoming. Uh, as the problem of evil, uh, the significance of which the Lisbon earthquake of 1755 or 54 uh, brought into focus, especially in relation to Voltaire and his satire Candide, uh, which ridiculed uh, Leibniz's best of all possible worlds, uh, theodicy, um, um, uh, um, made the problem um, 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 acute. Uh, to be sure, Christian faith continued to be presumed by the masses and the popular power of clergy remained very high. But among intellectuals, or one might say, among those considered to be cultural elites, uh, Christian faith was, and in theory, all faiths were, um, in disrepute. Let me, note to digress, let me digress to note that especially in the 20th century, but even today, well into the 21st century, uh, philosophy of religion textbooks will be comprised of sections on arguments for the existence of God, the teleological, the cosmological, the ontological. Um, they would talk about the possibility of miracles and then the problem of evil uh, with theism uh, failing on all counts. Um, this would be a devastating conclusion if any actual faith tradition had ever been grounded in such arguments. But in fact, all these arguments arise in their this form as arguments of, in this sense in the modern period. In other words, they're not part of any faith tradition, uh, which means this entire exercise in fertility um, has been a tempest in a modern Western intellectual teapot. Um, so, um, um, pietism we've done now, and empiricism, or rationalism, empiricism really is what it becomes, we've done now, and now romanticism, uh, which is in part a reaction, a secular reaction against empiricism. So romanticism is in part a secular reaction against empiricism's cold uh, mechanical vision of reality. While rationalism and empiricism tended to an order, towards seeing the world as a great mechanism, a machine operating according to the laws of nature. Remember Paley's big metaphor that's so easily accepted by everyone is of a watch. Um, romanticism stressed the storm and passion of life. Um, whereas empiricism tended to look outward to the world, uh, to the appearances, uh, romanticism, strove, romanticism strove to look through the appearances uh, with which the sciences were concerned now strove to unveil the existential spiritual depths of nature and the self. The emphasis was not upon encountering the world through intellect and reason, but connecting with the depths of nature through passion and the heart. Unveiling such connections with the depths of nature was the gift bequeathed upon us by great works of art and by great artists, um, by literature, music, painting, and so forth. That's what they did. They helped us to penetrate to the spiritual, uh, existential spiritual depths of reality. 
Uh, it was through one's sense of the depth of nature that the most profound and fulfilling dimensions of reality could be enjoyed. So Romanticism was profoundly religious in spirit, Although by that I don't mean they were part of any traditional faith tradition, uh, but they were profoundly kind of religious in that spiritual sense, and, and markedly sim similar then to pietism, um, but Romanticism lacks any theological dimension. Given the failures of natural religion, right, arguments for the exist exist existence of God, and the post-Reformation discrediting of straightforward appeals to any particular interpretation of scripture or the authority of any particular church, uh, because of the variety of churches' interpretations um, about even key issues, how is Christian theology credible? Uh, was not the only reasonable option to abandon theology. Could a theology be articulated that did not conflict with modern science, uh, that did not traffic in illegitimate appeals to authority, that did not violate standard canons of reasons, uh, reason that was not merely the product of human creativity, that did not re relegate God to a wholly other realm disconnected from present life and history, uh, and that was continuous with the historic Christian tradition and confession? Wesley in the 18th century already encountered early versions of these questions among some intellectual elites, but they had not yet permeated the culture of 18th century British intellectual elites um, at that point in the way they permeated the culture of intellectual elites who surrounded Schleiermacher um, at the end of the 18th, by the end of the 18th, in the beginning of the 19th century. Um, so Wesley is a prior generation. These questions are not yet presenting with the same power. Um, as they are by the end of the 18th century and, of course, into the 19th. Today, of course, what we would now call secular culture is still centered among intellectual elites, but its influence is now so great that it is common to refer to ours as a secular age. This is the sense in which Schleiermacher, in a far more complete sense than Wesley, lives in the modern secular world that has come to dominate modern Western cultures, and uh, to dominate among elites and trash, transnational regime, regime, regimes globally. This is no longer just a Western phenomenon. Um, by comparison, Spener, Wesley, Whitfield, and Edwards, let alone Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli in the Council of Trent, uh, Trent in the centuries before them, all still live in what, from the perspective of Enlightenment rationality, modern rationality, post-scientific revolution rationality is a largely magical world. They all live in a magical world, largely from that perspective, from the modern perspective. It is in this increasingly secular context that Schleiermacher, after having left his Moravian community, we'll talk about this in a moment, and establishing his academic bona, fide, um, bona fides, bona fides, how do you say it? Bona fides, bona fides would be Latin, so let me say it that way. It is in this period that he undertakes the translation of Plato's works, producing what would be, uh, for long be, the definitive German translation of Plato's dialogues. Um, it is in this context, his, uh, his uh, bona fides uh, uh, established, uh, that Schleiermacher took it upon himself to defend the faith within the context of modern rationality and science. So his first book, A Book of Modern Apologetics, published in 1799, um, his first authored book of his own, uh, is called On Religion, Speeches to Its Cultured Despisers. And it was an overnight sensation. On Religion was a rigorous attack upon intellectuals in Berlin uh, who were already seeing religion as an aspect of an obsolete stage of human development. In short, Schleiermacher at the beginning of the 19th century was taking up many of the same challenges that face people of faith, not just Christian faith, but of all faiths, uh, the challenges that face people of faith at the beginning of the 21st century. For this reason, he is often seen as the first truly modern Western theologian. So that sets his immediate context in the context of pietism, uh, empiricist rationality, or rationalism, empiricism, um, and um, uh, um, uh, what's that last one? Uh, empiricism, um, uh, oh, and romanticism, that's the third. Pietism, empiricism, and romanticism. Uh, it, it, those uh, confluence. Uh, before moving on, though, I want to uh, speak a little more on a macro context. Um, 
So uh, speaking incredibly broadly, but hopefully still hopefully, right? So a great big map before you, you know, narrow in and get the detail, which means there could be some things deceptive about the big map, but it's big map, but it's still helpful um, to locate yourself. Let's let's consider roughly the last millennium. Uh, with the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, Greek learning and advance in the sciences uh, continued only in the um, Byzantine, Byzantine, Byzantine Empire, um, in what had been the eastern side of the Roman Empire, um, as Europe fell into the so-called uh, Dark Ages. Um, and this is a, it is a time of, um, of, 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 of bright, uh, enlightened society, enlightened in, in, in the Islamic world, in, um, in the Byzantine Empire. Um, in 1453, uh, it's interesting to note, the Byzantine Empire falls, and what had been for centuries the Enlightened East uh, falls into its own version um, of the Dark Ages. Uh, as Northern Europe reorganized and learning from the East flowed into Northern Europe in the 11th and 12th centuries, Northern, uh, Northern Europe experiences um, a renaissance, what we call the renaissance a flowering of culture and understanding wherein translation is highly valued because new knowledge can be translated from Eastern Greek sources far more quickly than it can be discovered or thought out internally. Um, in the, you know, we're playing catch up in Northern Europe at that point, basically. Uh, in the Great Schism of 1054, uh, the church had split, splits into the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, the most influential new learning flowing into Europe from the East um, is largely Aristotelian and uh, largely Islamic, in contrast to the largely Platonic, philosophy, Platonic philosophical backdrop of the patristics, uh, which is why, for instance, we often speak of Augustine, a patristic uh, theologian of, of the um, fourth and fifth, early fifth centuries, as having accomplished a great synthesis of Christian and Platonic thought. Um, as we will discuss later, when Anselm of Canterbury, uh, who lived in um, the 11th to 12th um, century, um, that, those dates must be wrong. I'm going to pause for a second and figure out the, those dates. Okay, so those dates were wrong. Uh, the 1093 to 1109 was when the years he was Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, he lived 1030, and some of Canterbury, 1033 to 1109. So he lived in the 11th century. Uh, when, by the time he's writing, already by the time he's writing Cur Deus Homo, Why God Became Human, and develops his honor-based um, theory of substitutionary atonement, um, uh, and, and, and also by the time when Peter Abelard, who's basically his contemporary, just a little bit younger, uh, develops his moral influence theory of atonement, they are already presupposing a decidedly Aristotelian understanding of substance. Again, we'll go into that a bit later. It is Thomas Aquinas, however, um, in the 13th century, who finally creates the great Augustinian Aristotelian synthesis. So he um, and composes one of the first Christian responses to Islam. In his Summa Theologica, Logica, Summa Theologica, uh, Thomas refers to Aristotle simply as the philosopher. That's the status Aristotle has in his thought. Thomas's writings are condemned by the Roman hierarchy in his day and banned briefly after his death. Right, so he's in his own day he is condemned by the hierarchy, and his writings are even banned after his death. Ironically, this means that the Aristotelian Ptolemaic cosmology. Thomas is initially condemned for integrating into Christian theology in the early 13th century is precisely the cosmology Galileo is condemned for discrediting in the 17th century. Uh, so the, the cosmology that Galileo, the Sicilian Ptolemaic cosmology Galileo is condemned for, by the church for discrediting in the 17th century is only some 400 years old um, in, in Europe. <clears throat> uh, uh, that that, that Thomistic synthesis. Uh, despite the initial condemnation, then, Thomism be quickly becomes far and away the predominant theology of church, the church throughout um, the medieval period. And of course, in the medieval period, the church is, this is pre-Reformation, post-schism. So the church in Europe, uh, in Western Europe, in the medieval period is the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and, and Thomism remains influential uh, to this day. <clears throat> 
The Reformation takes place in the medieval world um, in a Thomistic Roman Catholic Church then. Uh, because of this taken for back, uh, granted background, cosmology and philosophy, for instance, uh, when Calvin writes about what causes faith, he explains the cause of faith in accord with Aristotle's fourfold understanding of causation. Uh, in other words, Calvin gives the material, the efficient, the final, and the formal causes of faith. Um, all the great Catholic and Protestant theologians of the medieval period Anselm, Abelard, Francis of Assisi, Bonaventure, Aquinas, and then in the 16th century, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, uh, the, the leaders at the Council of Trent, the Catholic Council of Trent, um, all these figures, Catholic and Protestant, they're all working within the pre-scientific revolution uh, mentality, the pre-enlightenment uh, medieval world. Um, in terms of conceptual transformations, or we might better say revolutions, uh, the Reformation uh, is a tornado uh, within uh, the medieval world um, and its cosmology, Aristotelian Ptolemaic cosmology. Whereas the scientific revolution of the very next century, within a hundred years of the Reformation, the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment are, a, are in terms of uh, revolutions, um, a class five hurricane. Uh, so the, the Ref if the Reformation is a tornado within the medieval world, um, the Enlightenment, the Scientific Revolution, is a class five hurricane, uh, which does away with the um, the um, medieval uh, cosmology entirely. So when we think in terms of the Scientific Revolution of the 17th century. Uh, the great names are not theologians, but scientists and philosophers, Kepler, Galileo, Descartes, Hobbes, Newton, and Locke. With the possible exceptions of Jonathan, uh, exception of Jonathan Edwards, there is likewise a gap in terms of systematic or philosophical theology um, in the 18th uh, century. Um, and, and Leibniz doesn't really give us a full-scale uh, philosophical theology, uh, I don't think, um, in the same sense. Um, Spener, uh, Wesley, and Zinzendorf, you know, theological figures in um, the um, 17th century, they never detail the relation of their theology to modern philosophy and science. Um, though, as I argued in my brief reflections upon Wesley, his conceptual sophistication on these issues, it may be his conceptual sophistication on these issues um, informed what he did write um, and explained the absence in his work, uh, I think it's a notable absence in Wesley's work, um, of the sort of overt appeals to authority um, which modern rationality had disqualified, um, and the sorts of appeals that, that don't feel right in relationship to modern science. Um, I think the absence of that, in contrast to, say, reading Luther um, and the, the worldview he has, is, is potentially significant. Uh, in this sense, I might argue that Wesley, not Schleiermacher, is de facto the first modern Christian phenomenologist, uh, for he roots his most fundamental appeals not in appeals to scripture, creed, or church teaching, uh, but in careful reflection upon our immediate lived experience of the, of the divine. Um, on the other hand, many Christian theologians, including not only the mystics, but even the likes of Calvin, arguably did the same. So maybe they uh, have some um, claim to a similar title, but it, it could be he has a distinct claim to be the first to do this in the modern context, although not with the degree of precision um, of Schleiermacher, uh, which is why Schleiermacher is going to be um, seen as the um, person who begins this phenomenological um, approach to theology. All right, I'm simply going to pull up from following this rabbit trail further, hoping I've said enough to justify the common affirmation that it is Schleiermacher who pens the first systematic theology in 1821 since Calvin in 1559. That, that's a 250 year gap uh, without a major systematic theology. Uh, people were doing theology all during that period, but they had not. Uh, Schleiermacher is the first one to give us a systematic approach to the, uh, theology, um, uh, with, which is working within the, the um, parameters and informed by um, modern uh, scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. For 250 years, theologians have basically been on their heels. Um, and, and then Schleiermacher is the first one to make a significant um, move in the, in, in the opposite direction. So that's why I've been describing this whole time. Um, for a more precise articulation of all of this, you can see my a reasonable belief. Um, also, in terms of this entire period, um, I mean, there's a lot of good books uh, in this area, but uh, Charles Taylor's Sources of the Self, 
um, is a great philosophical look at the conceptual trajectories, these and many others um, that I've been talking about. It's not a theological text, it's a philosophical text, uh, but it's very um, inclusive and significant um, for philosophical and, and theological reflection. Okay, finally, let me at least gesture to the reality um, that as I teach theology uh, at a Protestant seminary in Austin, Texas, which is where I'm doing this, um, making this video and teach, uh, which was first settled as Waterloo um, in 1833. I actually think that's wrong, too. I think it might be 1835, but I'm going to not break here and just alert you to that pr potential problem. Um, in an area still at that time dominated by the Comanche, um, especially, not just Austin, but especially as you moved west, they're the dominant um, nation uh, in this part of North America. Um, and, um, and, and so let me gesture to this reality and trace this conceptual history um, in a North American context. Um, and, and just to make clear, we're tracing a history that's virtually uh, non-existence in this hemisphere and for the first 500 years of the second millennium. So all this stuff I've been talking about with St. Francis, and Anselm, and Augustine, up till Calvin, uh, which we see as our history as we sit here, um, in uh, those of us who are sitting here um, in North America, it is in a sense our real history, but I just want to keep track of the fact that it's a real history from a, a different place, that, that, that the, the center of Christianity, one might say, um, is shifting. Of course, many now would say that the center of Christianity has, has shifted south, and, and um, we're going to do a uh, section on Gustavo Gutierrez, uh, where suddenly you have a Catholic understanding from the south of the Americas coming to the north uh, to inform us. So this is how, I just want to keep track of how this uh, shifts. Uh, Christianity is rooted, of course, in the Jewish history of the Middle East and North Africa, um, which was then essentially, um, you know, where, where Israel was in Palestine, uh, then essentially a crossroads of the known world, um, at least in the West. Um, and it was then on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean in the Roman Empire. Uh, and the Roman Empire, you can think of as circumnavigating the Mediterranean. So the center of the Roman Empire is the Mediterranean. Um, and, uh, and, and Rome... Um, uh, that territory uh, is, 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 is how, you know, so our references to Middle East and North Africa, you know, these references don't make sense within the conceptuality of the Roman Empire, uh, where, um, you know, so nor what we call North Africa might be seen as Southern Empire, Southern Roman Empire, I don't know what they talk about, but just kind of keep track of how these references are so contextual, just to be aware of that. So, um, and this is the context, of course, of the patristics. Um, so when we talk about the Council of, of Nicaea or in Alexandria, we are in what is today Turkey and Egypt. And, and when before I talked about St. Augustine, uh, the great August, Augustinian synthesis, which integrated Plato uh, into Christian thought, um, it, that, of course, is Augustine of Hippo. And Augustine of Hippo lived in what is today Tunisia. Um, and presumably there were some real hippos around. <laughs> um, though by then, Rome had long since expanded throughout Europe, up into northern Europe, um, and Augustine would witness the collapse of that em expansion, uh, in particular on the western part of the empire. Um, in the last years of his life, the Visigoths are defeating Roman forces and are sweeping down through southwestern Europe, um, and, and, and then east, right, east of him uh, in Africa, and coming across northern Africa towards uh, Hippo, which is now Tunisia. Um, and the, by the time of his death, enemy forces were nearly uh, at the gates of Hippo. Uh, so the near-term certain defeat of Hippo is something to bear in mind as one reads Augustine's later theological writings. Um, now, our class, of course, uh, which I'm doing this talk largely for, um, is my intro to theology, uh, figures and movements in modern Western theology class, is focused largely upon Protestant and, to a lesser degree, Roman Catholic theologians, what, which is in accord with our, by that I mean predominant Protestant denominations, uh, uh, political religious history, which flows largely from Western Europe. So, so we come from the Roman Catholic side of the Great Schism of 1054, uh, and then, of course, our history flows from the European context of the Protestant Reformation, and then to the United Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, and other uh, churches uh, as they have developed in the North American context. Um, and then with Gutierrez, again, we're going back to look at how North American Christianity is influenced from the South American uh, Roman Catholic context. 
And while doing all of this, um, remember that in the time of Assisi and Aquinas, uh, there was no Christianity and, and really no contact, virtually no contact in what will become the Americas. Um, and that this hemisphere was then full uh, and thriving with diverse civilizations and uh, people. So we remember still at the time of Luther and Calvin and the Reformation of 1517, there is only the most minimal contact at a few um, points on islands and on the coast of the Americas uh, with uh, European uh, civilization. Now, I'm not going to develop this in any particular direction, although hopefully um, the, the way in which I've been hesitating with different phrases and moving around has is, is, is alerted you to the way all of this history is fraught with uh, considerations that, that need to be taken um, uh, account of. I, I'm not going to go to any, into any of that now. We may discuss it some um, as, we, as we move on, but I did at least want to gesture towards these complex dynamics, um, which will figure in more detail uh, in, in various precise ways in, um, uh, in our study, and especially if you do more advanced study of theology. All right, so from a, the super macro uh, to a major stream of the relatively micro, Friedrich Schleiermacher and liberal uh, theology. And, and so here is his uh, uh, a brief biography, more straightforward brief biography, moving on from his uh, conceptual context. Uh, Schleiermacher was born on November 21st, 1768, in what is now the south of Poland. Um, his father was a reformed uh, pastor, a chaplain in the Prussian army. Um, neither Germany nor Poland um, exist at the time. They don't exist yet. The region was made up of a conglomerate of principalities, of which Prussia and Austria were the largest and most powerful, but they're not um, large and powerful compared to the nations and empires which surround them. Uh, Spain, Portugal, England, France, and Belgium uh, to the west and northwest are all major states and colonial powers. Um, to the east and southeast are the Empire of Russia and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the United States is a distant newborn at this point, um, and the Germanic peoples are a relatively weak confederation of states with no colonial power, um, and, uh, but are surrounded by major um, folks on every side, and they have only permeable natural barriers on every side. So they're surrounded by major powers with um, fairly permeable um, natural barriers um, on, on every side. Uh, Schleiermacher's father and mother were Enlightenment rationalists, um, so he grows up in a very educated sort of atmosphere, uh, but they had a conversion experience with the Moravians, and so they enrolled Friedrich um, uh, with his, or uh, Frederick, uh, with his sister and brother um, in a Moravian boarding school. Now, Schleiermacher is a very sensitive and relational young man, uh, he was sent to school when he was 15. Uh, he would never see his parents again. Uh, his mother unexpectedly died a few months after he entered school, and his father's military chaplaincy kept them separated, though they corresponded continuously. The community of brethren became Schleiermacher's family home during his adolescence. I mean, he's a virtual orphan. Uh, Schleiermacher was deeply formed by the Moravians, his experience and memories so warm that while he moved rapidly and radically away from conservative Moravian doctrine in his early 20s, later in life he would write his sister that he still thought of himself as a Hernhutter, a Moravian, if one of a higher order. In a letter he wrote from his Moravian boarding school, a young Schleiermacher, sounding much like Wesleyan uh, before Aldersgate in Bristol, uh, wrote that he was convinced of his inner corruption, but still sought in vain the inner certitude of grace, the supernatural experience of communion with Jesus. On the whole, though, uh, Schleiermacher's memories are not of angst, here he differs some from Wesley, but of happiness and rich spiritual communion in the warmth of the Moravian community. Now, while to say again, Schleiermacher would soon leave the Moravians because of differences in points of doctrine, he never forgot the warm spirit of the Moravian community, and I think you would be correct to discern a Moravian spirit at the heart of even his most mature theology. In 1787, after a brief stint at a Moravian uh, seminary, again, Schleiermacher, seeking out an atmosphere of free inquiry, uh, matriculates at the University of Hall at the age of 19. 
1796, in age of 28, uh, he became the reformed preacher to Berlin's biggest hospital. Uh, when you read Schleiermacher's works on suffering and death, it is important to remember that what he, uh, together with patients' families, would have experienced on a daily basis in that hospital. Uh, some of you have worked as chaplains and witnessed the pain and suffering present even in the most advanced medical facilities of the 21st century. Um, by contrast, we have some idea of the primitive character of Civil War medicine. Schleiermacher is pastor chaplain at the largest hospital in Berlin more than 60 years before the Civil War, uh, long before the discovery of germs, let alone anesthesia, antiseptics, and antibiotics. So you can imagine what he witnessed with suffering, terrified patients and their families. While working as the Reformed preacher at the hospital, Schleiermacher was also living and socializing with some of the most prominent intellectuals of the day. And the intellectuals of Berlin at this time were already living decidedly in the secular age. Uh, he was completing a translation of Plato's works, which become a standard in German, and in 1799, as mentioned above, he published an apologetics aimed at his intellectual atheistic friends in Berlin on religion, speeches to its cultured despisers. And this book made him famous overnight. Already in speeches, characteristic themes, though not yet mature, begin to emerge. In particular, he was already distinguishing knowledge, activity, and feeling. Uh, knowledge of the world was a sphere of science, Activity in the world was the sphere of art and ethics. Feeling, which for Schleiermacher names primordial awareness of oneself in relation to existence, or better, the, in relation to the existing of existence, is the sphere of religion. Uh, note, as we'll discuss further below um, in our discussion of his major themes in his theology, feeling should not be understood as a category of the senses, like in the sense of feeling a table, uh, nor should feeling in Schleiermacher's religious sense be confused with emotions, with feeling happy or feeling sad. Um, feeling for Schleiermacher names a primordial awareness of oneself in relation to the very dynamic of existing. Um, and here is where he's anticipating um, the phenomenology of Husserl and, and, and then of Heidegger. This is not feeling in relation to the world as understood in a sense of matter and space-time, but feeling as an awareness of our constant relation to, once we are awakened to and identify it, the infinite divine God as mediated through the ultimately dependent character of our very existence. Again, more on this when I talk about name themes in his theology, but you can see here where, where Schleiermacher is influenced both by um, empiricism, because he wants to remain faithful to that, but also by romanticism, which wants to penetrate be beneath the appearances uh, to the existential spiritual depths of nature, but with a theological dimension. So there's where the pietism also is very much an influence upon his thought. In 1804, Schleiermacher was appointed by the Prussian government to a professorship back at the University of Hall, uh, where he had studied after, so this is where he got his BA, essentially, uh, where he had studied after leaving the Moravian community. Um, and he's there uh, appointed to a professorship and to the post of university preachers at age 36. Um, he, uh, he serves there as a professor and preacher for two years until in 1806 when Prussia is invaded by France and her forces are crushed by Napoleon. Uh, Schleiermacher personally watched uh, the battle for Hall and saw Hall fall to French forces. Uh, here again, as we remember what it would have been like to be a chaplain at the ho biggest hospital in Berlin, be sure to bring to mind what Schleiermacher would have witnessed in a real battle in 1806. Schleiermacher and his land were on the losing side of the battle. Uh, his own house was plundered and occupied by French troops. His church building was turned into a storage facility for grain. The city of Hall itself was detached from Prussia and granted to Westphalia. Uh, so only after two years after he was appointed there, Schleiermacher's country has been defeated, his university has been dissolved, his life is in tatters at the age of 38. At this juncture, the Prussian-Germanic patriotism of Schleiermacher, the son of a Prussian army chaplain, uh, begins to emerge strongly. In 1807, Schleiermacher returns to Berlin, where he begins long-term, deeply influential work on the reform of the Prussian education and political system, with the goal of achieving the unification of a German state. 
Uh, having lived through the chaos, sufferings, and humiliations of defeat to Napoleon, Schleiermacher is an outspoken German nationalist, and in that context of marginalization and defeat, his nationalism is understand understandable. Um, read his sermons and writings in the 20th century context, however, when one thinks in terms of the Germany of World War I and World War II, and his nationalism is disturbing. Um, and it is fair to think that even speaking in the context of a defeated and humility, humiliated people, he should nonetheless have framed his affirmations far more carefully, as history had already supplied more than enough seesaw examples of the oppressed gaining power and becoming oppressors. In any case, Schleiermacher's nationalism is undoubtedly partly in play in Karl Barth's strident rejection of liberal theology and of Schleiermacher, after most all of Barth's liberal professors, for whom he had had deep respect, were among the 93 German scientists, scholars, and artists who signed uh, what, in hindsight, and at the time for Barth, but in hindsight by, by everyone, is seen as a notorious declaration um, in support of the nationalism of Kaiser Wilhelm II um, and Germany's aggressive moves at the onset of World War I. Um, and, and Karl Barth uh, uh, is to be distinguished. Um, um, we might think different things of his theology, but his, um, his instincts of what was right uh, in various contexts tend to be uh, true. Um, and it was him, not his liberal professors, who saw the need to stand against the nationalism of Kaiser Wilhelm uh, II. At any rate, that gives some context for Barth's vehemence um, against Schleiermacher, a vehemence which will decline later in Barth's life, um, as he, he reads Schleiermacher outside of this particular context, makes some allowances for it. Uh, in 1809, at the age of 41, Schleiermacher marries Henrietta von, von Willig, Willig? Um, the widow of an old friend, and becomes the minister of Trinity Church in Berlin. Um, he will preach weekly at Trinity Church uh, until he falls ill with the pneumonia, which will take his life in 1834. His celebrated weekly sermons make Trinity Church famous throughout Berlin and Europe, um, and among the youth who passed through his confirmation classes at Trinity Church, and here again, remember Schleiermacher's nationalism, uh, one of the youths who he went through his uh, confirmation classes was Otto van Bismarck, uh, who will go on to form the German Empire, which uh, Bismarck will then lead for nearly two decades, from 1871 to 1890, during which time Germany comes to largely dominate European affairs. Uh, so the Germany of the early 19th century that Schleiermacher knew in defeat, um, the scattering of uh, different states, uh, by the end of that century has become the powerhouse that we think of when we think of Germany uh, from our perspective in the 20th or early 21st century. In 1810, when he's 42, Schleiermacher is appointed to an advisory post in the Ministry of Education. Uh, Schleiermacher was then instrumental in the creation of the University of Berlin, where he was appointed to a chair in theology and was made the first dean of the theological faculty, all still in 1810 and all while continuing to preach at Trinity Church, which, again, he does weekly through the rest of his life. In 1815, Schleiermacher is appointed rector of the University of Berlin. In 1818, Hegel arrives, uh, taking the post of the university that had been held by Fichte until his death a few years prior. Fichte, and especially Hegel, are significant philosophers, with Hegel often counted, along with Plato, Aristotle, and Kant, as among the five or six most influential philosophers in the entire Western canon. Uh, in 1821, Schleiermacher publishes the first edition of his mammoth uh, systematic theology, the Christian faith. Uh, he completes a major revision and expansion in 1831, and of course that's uh, this volume, which I showed you at the beginning of my talk. Hopefully, uh, it will be uh, helpful if I briefly repeat myself here. This is the first significant systematic work in theology to appear since Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, which appeared nearly three centuries earlier, uh, in 1536, with five revised editions, um, the 1559 edition of the Institutes being the last and by far the longest. The great Reformed and Catholic theologians of the 16th century all live in the final century uh, when the medieval Aristotelian Ptolemaic cosmology and science would predominate. Um, in a word, the great 16th century Reformers and Catholics were medieval, uh, 
their entire con cosmological conceptual frame within which they conceived their theology would be demolished with the advances of the 17th century scientific revolution and the so-called Age of Enlightenment. Uh, theological works were written in the 17th and 18th centuries, but not until Schleiermacher do we see a legitimate, systematic attempt to engage in theology while working firmly within the parameters of modern, that is, post-scientific revolution, post-enlightenment, Western rationality. This is a sense in which Schleiermacher is referred to as the founder of modern theology. Alternately, he is seen as the originator of liberal theology. Uh, this may be seen only as a variance in terminology, or it may name what is Schleiermacher, what Schleiermacher's theology becomes over the course of the 19th century as liberal theology, um, as the Platonic idealism, which infuses Schleiermacher's thought, is supplanted and increasingly leveled within the empiricist bounds of a naturalistic cosmology. That's the sense in which I think there might be a distinction between the liberal theology of the late 19th century, which traces itself to Schleiermacher, and Schleiermacher's theology um, itself. Over the course of his teaching at Berlin, informed by his work translating Plato, and especially out of concern to find a science of interpretation for scripture, for rules of interpretation, um, you know, varied wildly among Catholic and various Protestant denominations, um, undercutting the very idea of uh, the reasonableness of looking at scriptures for guidance. Um, for this reason, Schleiermacher engages um, in sophisticated reflections in the dynamics of interpretation, composing a hermene hermeneutical theory so formidable that today Schleiermacher is best known in 21st century university departments of philosophy and literature, by that I mean secular departments of philosophy and literature, he's best known as the originator of modern hermeneutics, not the originator of modern theology, but the originator of modern hermeneutics, uh, typically without any reference or even any knowledge of his role as a preacher and a theologian. Then in ways I will not begin to go in here, uh, into here, his hermeneutics and the character of his hermeneutics is tightly tied to the phenomenology um, that grounds his theology. Just to throw that out there. In 1829, uh, Schleiermacher's only son dies at the age of nine. Uh, so again, when you're reading, especially his master, his, his master revision of his Christian faith, uh, you have a person who has uh, been a chaplain in brutal conditions in the largest hospital in Berlin, who's been preaching weekly for decades and famously, uh, who has been um, a victim of defeat by a foreign power, uh, who's lost his nine-year-old son. Um, so, so just to keep that all in mind as you read Schleiermacher, um, especially his later work, in terms of, of who he is as a person and his life experiences. Uh, five years later, on February 12th of 1834, Schleiermacher himself dies of pneumonia. Uh, he is 65. Literally thousands of people lined the streets of Berlin as the carriage carrying his castic, casket passed by. Um, a testimony to his theological, um, and I'd like to add then philosophical, although his influence in hermeneutics comes later, but a testimony to his theological and political influence in Berlin, Prussia, and beyond.